Hey, what's going on? Before we continue my first ever journey through the Harry Potter series, I just have a few quick announcements. First, August 3rd, 7 p.m. in Seattle, Washington is the Potterless Live Show at Jet City Improv. If you are in the area, I would love it if you could come. I'm gonna be talking about a chapter of Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows. I'm gonna do some Q&A, and then after the show, we're gonna hang out at a bar next door so I can meet all your faces. So if you want to get to that, go to bit.ly slash potterlesssea, and I hope to see you there. And the weekend after that, I will be at LeakyCon in Dallas. So if you are going to be at LeakyCon, reach out to me on social media. We'll meet up. It'll be fantastic. And if you just happen to live in the DFW area, I'm going to do some sort of meetup outside of the convention center so I can meet again your faces, say hello, etc. So if you want any information on that, just make sure you're following Potterless on Twitter at PotterlessPod. That's where I'll be posting all the updates of my whereabouts and the details to come. Also, as you probably noticed last week as I posted the first episode of it, I launched a new podcast called Horse. I'm co-hosting it with Eric Silver. It's a basketball podcast about everything related to the NBA except for the actual game. So it's only things that are fun, like player drama and silly nicknames, all sorts of good stuff like that. So if you search for Horse or Multitude in your podcast app, it'll show up. And if you're wondering what Multitude is, it's an audio collective that I am a part of with Potterless and Horse, but there's some other amazing podcasts on there like Spirits, which is a drunken dive into mythology and legends, Join the Party, which is a real play Dungeons and Dragons podcast with amazing storytelling and amazing editing, and Way Station, a fan cast about the Canadian show Lost Girl. So lots of good stuff there. And if you want more information about any of the shows, just head to multitude.productions. And speaking of people that warm my heart and bring smiles to my faces, we have new patrons to welcome to the team. So shout out to Abigail Johnson, Hannah Noy, Sierra White, Rachel Cohen, Sasha Starr, Claudia Berdzinska, Carol Tenorio, Kaylee Totten, Leslie Ferguson, Mary, Catherine Kibler, Sultan Kara, Pamela Ramirez, Sarah Shackleford, Laura Samilla, Nita Gill, Grace, Kat Jones, Neil Kingston, Oliver Bo. Wind, Stephen, Vanessa Marie Garzon, Naomi Sharples, Kristen Seif Dowditer, Anna Sandor, Katie Wells, Ulrike Pelgrim, Gal Tamara Carney, and Cassandra Utas, as well as Sarah Walbrun and Maya, who upgraded their pledge, and a huge shout out to our news producer level patrons Zachary Polito, Gabrielle Medcroft, Jessica Ann, Natalie Jung, Arna Goodnadotter, Brandy Boldonado, Melody McInnes, Jonathan Swaney, Lexi Vergara, a happy birthday to Kristen Chavez, and to Sandy and Avnish Saxena, your sister Akanksha misses you. They joined the ranks of Leanne Vicky, Aaron, Erica, Calvin, Sadie, Jesse, Natalie, Deborah, Clow, Alex, Rebecca, Frank, Marchismo, Tori, Samantha, Juan, Jenna, Kieran, Louise, Akanksha, Rebecca, Abid, Caitlin, Benjamin, Rosemarie, Jill, Maria, Maria, Lisa, Ariel, Romina, Camille, Anthony, Diego, Russell, Jenny, Dustin, Katie, Audrey, Indiana, Eleanor, Sydney, Bill, Rossanne, Micah, Andrea, Nikita, Colette, Chrissy, Shrina, Jeremy, Stephen, Lala, Chelsea, Taylor, Sammy, Lovekesh, Shivarni, Ali, Kalmage, Cassandra, Roxy, Melissa, Amelia, Vince, Sean, Jeremiah, Courtney, Sarah, Jesus, Ben, Emily, Francisco, Rachel, Mary, and Sharice, who always know exactly what goes in the compost bin, what goes in the landfill bin and what goes in recycling and they don't stand there in front of the trash cans like an idiot for 15 seconds. If you want to be like one of these wonderful human beings and get access to bonus episodes, live streams, discounts on the merch, patron exclusive merch, you can go to patreon.com slash Potterless. So without further ado, let's get into episode 47 of Potterless covering chapter 17 of Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince starring Miel Bredo of Punch Up the Jam. And welcome back to another episode of Potterless, the tale of a 26-year-old man reading the Harry Potter series for the first time. My name is Mike Schubert. I am that 26-year-old man. And I am joined by a good old internet friend of mine back from the Vine days. Remember when that existed? <laughs> ah, yes. You know her. You love her. You probably remember for the hemorrhoid Vine. It's Miel Bredo. How's it going, Miel? Hi. Good. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Thanks for being here. I also should probably say that you also co-host a hilarious podcast called Punch Up the Jam, where you and other Vine friend, Demi, uh, take great <laughs> songs and then make them better which is always fun hey thanks man it's uh it's kind of a crazy thing that we do for fun and it's so much work <laughs> yes it is oh man remember the glory days when all we had to do was point our phone at our faces for six seconds oh, yeah. and then make dumb jokes and now we have to work <laughs> <laughs> Although that didn't pay us either, so I mean, no, it's yeah, really that didn't different. pay us at all. Uh, well, I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I'm definitely happier, <laughs> and yes. I don't think podcasts are gonna, you know, get bought by Twitter and then viciously murder. <laughs> <laughs> Thankfully, knock on wood. 
<laughs> oh gosh, yeah, that'd be the worst. So we are going to be covering chapters 17 and 18 of Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince, and they're all Slughorn themed, which is very fun. I feel like it's especially <laughs> appropriate because I live in LA and I'm in the entertainment industry, and it's like Slughorn feels like everybody I have to work with. Ooh, I like it. I got a weird vibe from him from the beginning. Over the course of the episodes of Potterless, I have shit-talked Slytherin a lot because so far, all the Slytherins we've met have been racist. Yes. Like, none of them are good. Nobody's nice. And some people are like, you're so mean to Slytherins. I'm like, name a good one. And then people will tell me Slughorn's good. And I'm reading the beginning of this book. I'm like, no, he's not. This guy's so sleazy. I don't like him. He's a flawed man. <laughs> yeah. He seems like a good teacher, but a bad person. It's also going to be so impossible to not speak in the future tense like to only talk about these two chapters when you haven't read yes. anything. Have people uh, spoiled that for you already or no? So I think that some people have spoiled things on episodes before, but I haven't noticed any because <laughs> a couple of people will be like, oh my God, I can't believe so-and-so said a spoiler on episode whatever. And I think, oh, I, I didn't catch anything. So thankfully by recording, I haven't uh, had anything spoiled. Basically the go-to is if I say some sort of like guess about what's going to happen next, mm -hmm. all you have to do is just be like, hmm, interesting and you're fine. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I feel accomplished enough as an actor to handle that, I think. <laughs> I believe in you. I think you're going to do great. But yes, I can understand it being hard, especially with these chapters, because Ooh. I can sense shit coming down <laughs> and raining from the skies yep. very soon. When you told me these two chapters off the top of my dome, I wasn't sure which ones they were. And then the second I started reading them, I was like, oh, no, you yeah, gave me two of the <laughs> juiciest ones. <laughs> it basically is like horcruxes exist. And then it's like, but we're not telling you what they are. <laughs> but do you know that word yet? Have, like, just as a yeah consumer. as far as like spoilers that i know going forward i know snape kills dumbledore uh, but i don't know why okay. and i know that horcruxes were a word in the harry potter world like i knew thestral was also a word but i didn't know what it was before reading these chapters i had no idea what they are i still have no idea what they are and we'll get into <laughs> what i think they are when it's revealed perfect <laughs> so let's get it kicking with chapter 17 which is called a sluggish memory and my first note was i wrote like slughorn and then 75 percent of the way through it's like oh this is a dumb pun by jk <laughs> Rowling. I mean, are you uh, surprised though? No, and I appreciate it. She's <laughs> Who trying. Love a good pun? I know. She's <laughs> doing it. I love it. <laughs> It's great. So basically, the kids have to return to Hogwarts from break. And the way that they do that is the school set up a one-off connection to the flute network so that they can get back safely. And I'm glad the school is doing something that's actually safe for once. Whereas in the past, they've been, oh, we have a convicted murderer on campus. Let's just have hall monitors. Okay, so it's okay. Like, I'm hesitant to come right out the gate just, like, pointing out bad things because I do love it. these Please books. do. But it's so funny to me that they have this big conceit of, like, we had to have the train because you can't possibly <laughs> flee right into Hogwarts. It's too much of a safety issue. And then they just do. <laughs> it's funny because they have the train where it's like, we have to be safe. We have to have the train. And now when it's like, we have to be safe, there's people getting murdered all the time. <laughs> well, we can't use the train. <laughs> and also they flew right into McGonagall's office and she, what does mm -hmm. it say? Barely glanced up from her work. And I'm like, yes. I feel like you'd be a little vigilant about this, just making sure no one abused it, right? Yep. I underlined that twice in my book just because I love how sassy and perfect McGonagall is. Uh, she just has like no time to pay any mention to these children. But you're right. She should have like a roll call list and make sure everyone gets in. If the whole point of this was don't get murdered by Voldemort, they should have stuff in play. And also, where did all the other kids flew into? Is it just McGonagall's office is like the lobby? I guess they probably know what house everyone's in. And then they went to the offices of their head of houses. Yeah, that makes Ron, sense. Ron, Jenny and Harry are all Gryffindor. So they go in. But what about what would the Patils do? Because those twin sisters are in different houses. And... <laughs> <laughs> they would have two flus set up. This is just a lot of work. <laughs> it's way too... Well, we can't have them fly into the Ravenclaw one. <laughs> this is like a practical nightmare for whoever had to set up all these flus. Yeah. Oh, the teacher's like drew straws and then Sprout gets it. She's like, son of a bitch, really? <laughs> I got to do the flu thing, Dumbledore? Come on. Just put him on the train. <laughs> it's a bold move and I respect it. <laughs> so Mrs. Weasley is the only person left to wish them goodbye and... And she is just a mess. She's in tears. She is distraught. It's so sad. Oh, she's so good. Mrs. Weasley just warms my heart. She is the best mom. I was so inspired when I first read these books back in, what, 1990. Eight. Um, <laughs> that I, I bef this is long before the movies, and they reference the burrow for the first time. I was like so taken by the Weasleys' charm that I like. I remember writing out the burrow as I imagined it would be written on the <gasps> sign, and like putting it up in my parents' house. Yes, that's so good. That is adorable. <laughs> so dorky. 
<laughs> I love it though. And that's why you're on the podcast. Uh, <laughs> so apparently she's been crying ever since Percy stormed off, quote, with his glasses splattered with mashed parsnip for which Fred, George, and Ginny all claimed credit. They don't tell you what exactly happened, but I'm imagining that he said something dumb because Percy's the worst and they just chucked food at his face and he went off in a big storm. <sighs> so she said about that because she's a good mom. But Ron says, quote, he's such a prat, so it's not really a loss, is it? What an empathetic son. <laughs> and a great brother. But Percy sucks so much. He's so bad. Are they just assuming that it's like once you have more than four siblings, like, eh. There's got to be a bad one at one point. <laughs> like, there's a rotten egg. Uh, yeah, like, what? Uh, who's the bad? Uh, I was going to ask who's the bad Jackson from the Jackson Five, but I'm like, oh, Michael. I think it's nice. jo- No, it's Joe. It's the dad. Let's be oh, honest. Oh, okay. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, yep, yep, yep. Worst one. Uh, <laughs> so uh, Mrs. Weasley sobs even harder when she says goodbye to Harry. She says, promise you'll look after yourself, stay out of trouble. She's just the mom of the year. And Harry actually replies back with a great joke. He says, I always do, Mrs. Weasley. I live a quiet life. You know me, which, uh, nice. that witty Potter. <laughs> nice, Harry. Little zing. <laughs> so, yes, they land in McGonagall's office. And as you said, she barely glances up from her work. And she says, don't get too much ash on my carpet. Uh, l- just love her. What a caring person. <laughs> I'm surprised she didn't, like, roll out some kind of construction paper situation for Ooh. the kids to walk across. They're kids. They're going to make a mess. I guess also, can't she just clean all the ash with magic, right? (laughs) (laughs) This is is really a concern. Surprise, (laughs) there's ever ash in her chimney. Yeah. Just hoopity boo. Get that out of there. It's (laughs) gone. So those three then go to the fat lady painting outside of the Gryffindor common room. Hermione sees them and she yells, Harry, Ginny, and no one else, clearly (laughs) pretending that Ron doesn't exist, which I love her dedication to not acknowledging Ron's existence. I feel like like the sass of Hermione just continues to grow as the books escalate. It just, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And it's like getting to the point where in this one, it's kind of mean, but Ron is also a jerk. So it's fine. Yes. But yes, she ignores them. And even she asks, how was your Christmas break? And Ron starts to say, oh, it's really interesting. Scrimger came and she pretends he hasn't spoken. She interrupts to say, oh, I have something for you, Harry. Then the password to the common room for the fat lady painting, the kids get it wrong, but then Hermione knows that it's abstinence because apparently she drank a vat of wine with her friend Violet. The vat of wine came from a picture of drunk monks in the charms hallway, which raises a lot of questions. So many questions. First of all, uh, does that wine refill after you drink it? Exactly. (laughs) Second of all, if it doesn't, is there a finite amount of wine for the painting universe? Mm-hmm. Are you just, I mean, wouldn't it be if you're a 300 year old painting? Sorry, bud, you're too late. <laughs> or if you're a new painting and you have wine in your painting that people just bum rush you and take it immediately. Uh. <laughs> I have so many questions about the painting world here. There's also a question of why did J.K. Rowling put this in the book? <laughs> and also, like, you, she had to know that abstinence is not pr- predominantly used in America to refer to, like, abstaining from booze. Uh, this is the same woman that uses ejaculate to say yell. So I don't think she's a, <laughs> I don't think she's familiar with what American people say. True. I'll give her some credit <laughs> for that. <laughs> but yeah, when I read abstinence, I was like, whoa. Uh, and then it got late. And I was like, oh, right. I guess. Sure. Oh, she had a loose brain. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, getting it on with who's the who's the the knight that's like really annoying, uh, like Sir something with a C. He's if the you guy. Think that I'm like, gonna remember some names. You are very <laughs> wrong. I am horrible with names. <laughs> I'm literally googling annoying knight painting Harry Potter. <laughs> And it's going to come up. Oh, uh, Sir Cadogan. There it is. There it is. <laughs> Never would have gotten that. <laughs> Thank you, Google. I knew it was something with a C, but I didn't know what it was. The other thing I wanted to note is that she drank the wine all the way through. My good, good friends who host the podcast Spirits, if they were guests on this podcast, they would have said same. Uh, <laughs> so <laughs> just got to give a little shout out to Amanda and Julia. There. What else are you going to do stuck in a painting forever? Yeah, right. You get bored. So yeah. you find your painting friend and you get drunk, especially when there's no kids there. And you can't die. Try every drug. Right? Yeah. Why can't you get a hangover? over uh too many questions <laughs> <laughs> this gift that Hermione had for Harry is a parchment from Dumbledore explaining their next lesson and Harry is excited about it because he has so many things to tell Dumbledore namely the Draco Malfoy Snape 
conversation he overheard. As they are talking, they hear a screech of Wan Wan from Lavender Brown. And I had seen people say Wan Wan before, but I didn't know what this was. I thought this was just people like being cute. I was like, maybe Molly calls him Wan Wan at some point or anything. Uh, was not expecting pet name from Lavender. And this is bad. <laughs> I mean, I agree that it's bad, but I feel like the, they did Lavender dirty. Yes. You have dumb pet names in early mm-hmm. relationships. We all did, right? But you just don't say them in public. And I, I would guess. like to think Lavender is isn't this bad, but they really are like, you know who's going to suck in this book? Lavender Brown. (laughs) I know. And I feel like it's so often, this is like maybe too broad, but she often makes like an annoying girl. Oh, yes. And I'm a little bit like JK. Yeah. I mean, she makes like, oh, Cho Chang crying all the damn time. What a loser. Be like, her boyfriend died. It's okay. (laughs) There's no guidance counselor. dead. (laughs) So that happened. Then she did it to Fleur in the beginning of this book. And I talked about some on the episodes, which I found so strange is that in the fourth book, Fleur is like Fleur de la Cour. She's so strong and smart and powerful. And then this book, it's like Fleur de la Cour looks at herself in a spoon and like (laughs) thinks how pretty she is. (laughs) <laughs> There's definitely a little projecting happening. I feel like it's like, oh yeah. So I don't know. You're right. She does do this, and it seems a bit unnecessary. So it says several onlookers sniggered, not snickered. And I had to read that word a couple times. Like, mm. ugh, that's too close. You're one letter away from being not good. Yeah. And if you say that word too quickly, that's gonna cause a lot of problems. Let's just say snickered, please. Yeah, you're gonna have to bleep it on their podcast. <laughs> oh, ugh, mm, <laughs> or just really pronounce the s in the beginning, really, <laughs> really hard. So Hermione also laughs at this and then asks Ginny, hey, uh, me and Harry are going to grab a table over here. Do you want to sit with us? And Ginny says, no, I promised I'd meet Dean. And then, quote, though Harry could not help noticing that she did not sound very enthusiastic. And Uh. I love how dearly he is holding on to hope. And I have so been there in middle school. (laughs) (laughs) To me, it's weird, though, that like they're not further in this one-sided or maybe mutual crush situation, it feels like, what did they do over break? Like, there, something would have happened, right? For it to come up now? It's been something that's been boiling, like, throughout the books where it's just, like, Harry started to realize how much he liked her when he saw her, like, getting more serious with Dean. And then it was, like, zero to 100 real quick for Harry. Yeah. <laughs> Which is crazy because she's been so cool the whole time. Yep. She's been great the whole time. And even in the beginning, Ginny, you know, she had the big old crush on Harry before she started dating other people. So I guess that's like what we're supposed to think is like, oh, well, Ginny used to love Harry. So she's still got to have some sort of feelings. Right. But because Harry is like the de facto narrator, we never hear Ginny be like, oh, Harry looked good today or something. <laughs> Imagine <laughs> so, if just one chapter did, though. Wouldn't that be fun? A Ginny chapter would be so good because she's so sassy with the things she says out loud. Imagine yeah. the things she's thinking. <laughs> right. Right? Also, like, this is just textbook, like, you want what you can't have. Like, Harry, mm-hmm. come on, bud. Yeah, he doesn't realize how much he loves Ginny until he sees her literally making out with another boy. Uh-huh. Like, that's what it takes until he's like, oh, right, I have a big crush on her. Uh-huh. Okay, Harry, I see you. <laughs> so uh, Harry asks Hermione how Christmas was. She says, fine. She goes, how was it at Wan Wan's? Which is great. Love Hermione keeping the sass up. <laughs> She's holding on to this grudge, and it's great. Reaching her final form. Oh, she really is. <laughs> Harry tries to bring up, like, oh, can't you just smooth things over? And Hermione's like, no, I can't. And she says, quote, the fat lady's the one that drank a fat of 500-year-old wine, not me. I love the immediate callback. <laughs> mm-hmm. It's like, remember this thing that didn't make sense from two paragraphs ago? Don't worry. This is why it stayed in the book. For this sick joke. Uh, (laughs) So Hermione and Harry start talking about the Malfoy thing. She basically agrees with Mr. Weasley and Lupin that Snape is probably just trying to get Malfoy to say what he's doing. He's not like actually being evil. But Harry. (laughs) But Harry. (laughs) Harry never, never wanting to trust me. (laughs) He's having none of this. He really is trying to use this uh, and he's trying to get Hermione to agree with him that this basically confirms that Malfoy is a Death Eater, right? Which is just like bad practice. Like that's not how court works. (laughs) works (laughs) no harry is trying to do guilty until proven innocent and it's not great he's trying to grasp at anything he can and hermione does give him credit which is valid that it is a sketchy thing but she says you can't jump to this conclusion just yet Harry then brings up the uh, Fenrir Greyback thing because Hermione asks, how's Lupin? He mentions the werewolf Fenrir thing. And he asks, do you know about this Fenrir Greyback character? And she's <laughs> like, uh, yeah, and so do you. We both heard his name for the first time together when we listened to Malfoy. <laughs> but you know what? 
it's such a common name. Oh yeah, Fenrir Greyback. You know, <laughs> how could you remember it? Right. It's it's like basically Michael of the Wizarding World. Like they're so <laughs> they're so like his name's basically Michael Smith. It's just very forgettable. I mean, Hermione has just forgotten how dense Harry Potter is. You do wonder why is Hermione friends with him? Do you know what I mean? <laughs> like this is one of those moments where you're like. What is he bringing to the table in this friendship? <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm surprised that Hermione has not found, even if it was someone at Ravenclaw, like someone to yes. match her intelligence level because she has to constantly deal with Harry and Ron who are very, very dense and very persistent on like, it's always Snape and Malfoy and nobody else can be evil. And they always ask her for homework help all yes. the time. She, they're both, Ron and Harry are both super grudge driven mm -hmm. and like maybe only brave when it's like vaguely vengeance related. <laughs> <laughs> Hermione's like super smart and like has a ton going on. I don't understand. I guess that he's famous. That's like a cool thing. But like at, yeah. at year six, I don't know. I guess part of it was in the beginning and people gave me flack for this when I started. The first two books, Hermione kind of sucks. She's really <laughs> annoying and people don't like her. And Ron and Harry were still friends with her then. So I guess, you know, she's appreciating that they were, but even they were kind of mean to her then. Yeah. They were like, oh, that dumb girl who raises her hand all the time. Yes. Yeah. Maybe, I guess, I don't know. You would think at least by this point, she would have grown out of that and more people at the school should be like, whoa, Hermione's super cool. Right. And you would think she would have like graduated to better friends. Right. <laughs> and also like, I mean, I'm not going to like hit on this much because it's too controversial, but I do think it's another example of like a fairly poorly written woman in this mm. universe. Because mm -hmm. yeah. like, even though maybe they've started in the same place. I feel like she's kind of out evolved them at this point. And I don't yes. totally understand other than familiarity, why she would still be friends with them. I guess the good thing is they could like, they balance her out a little bit because she's so high strung and they're so chill. True. And the only other thing I can think of is like what they have gone through is like, they have gone through hell together. They have fought Voldemort multiple true. times and they have the old ministry thing. But I think it would just make sense. Like it seems like Hermione and Ginny should be a lot closer. <gasps> right. Right? <laughs> it seems like they should be best friends. That's the duo we deserve. We just, oh, a, a book that's just about the two of them. Yeah! From their perspectives. Like one of those alternate chapter books, but it's like between those two. Yes, uh. I want to see them go to like Tulum for the summer. You know what I mean? Ooh. What would that be like? They, they make a garden. They drink a couple pina coladas. I don't Love know. it. <laughs> I'm on board. So yes, I agree with you there. So she catches him up to speed about like the whole why you should remember who Fenrir is. And Harry's like, oh, okay. This means he's a death eater right and Hermione goes no maybe it was just an empty threat and Harry's like you're unbelievable and I kind of want Harry to be correct just because I think the told you so chapter would be very fun yes true <laughs> so like yes he's kind of being too much here but him saying told you so for an entire chapter would be very enjoyable I think a true delight <laughs> so he then tells her about the scrimger situation and then the narrator says, quote, the rest of the evening passed amicably with both of them abusing the minister, which is true, friends, spending a whole night together just shit talking someone that was mean to you. If there's two things that bond you, it's one, trauma, and two, hating the same people. It's so good. It is the truest <laughs> form of friendship. So the next morning, the kids go downstairs and they see a sign for apparition lessons. And... I have two problems with apparition. Okay. First, why is it not apparition? Because <laughs> they say to apparate. So why is it not apparition? I mean, you're going to have to wait till you get JK on the show. Oh, God, that will be a bad 12 episode series like I've, I've mentioned this before but if I ever did an interview there I would just ask her the dumbest question like <laughs> nothing nothing substantial <laughs> it would just be the silliest this she'd be like really this is what I gave you an hour of my time and you asked me <laughs> why why I said apparition instead of apparition <laughs> I think I think you gotta suspend disbelief for things like that because every word is made up right it is it is it's just to me it, it just bugs me but the other thing that is I find annoying is that every time the book writes apparition they give it a capital a <laughs> which i get is because like we are reading it and we are muggles and this is like a wizard thing so you have to capitalize stuff but that would be like every time you were saying oh yeah i gotta go drive over to someone's house and it's capital d <laughs> or like i was driving my car with a capital d because apparition is like that like this is the equivalent of getting your license well maybe it's more sacred there i <laughs> yeah they do seem to be a bit harsh about it you have to be a certain year and it costs money to take the lessons which by the way <laughs> i had to google if galleons was a british currency <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> like, is that real money i don't know actually 
actually. I'm glad that you had the thought to do that because there were a lot of episodes where there were British things happen. I was like, oh, this is magic. And it's like, no, treacle tart is a British dessert. It's not a made up magic well, word. You're exposing yourself as a non Great British Bake Off listener. Nope, I do not watch. I have seen an improv show based on it, and that is the <laughs> furthest extent that I know about it, except that people watch it. Yeah, close enough. <laughs> so they see this sign for apparition lessons. There's going to be an outside teacher from the ministry teaching it. And it says that it costs 12 galleons, which I think a galleon is like roughly like 10 ish bucks. So it's like, it's like a hundred bucks. My question, which this raised and shout out to Chloe blue on Instagram who raised this concern for me. First off, why did the kids have to pay for it? Why is this not like the school just funded this, but also what is the tuition situation yes. at Hogwarts? I can't believe this hasn't come up yet. That was exactly Chloe messaged me. She's like, how have you not, you're so snarky and such a dick about everything. Why <laughs> have you not made fun of the fact that they never talk about tuition. It feels like a private school. It very much right? feels like it. Yeah, because it's invite only. And they have like room and board. I mean, that feels mm -hmm. like a prep school. And, and uniforms, that's a bougie prep school. Yeah. Maybe because the kids have to buy all of their own equipment for stuff and there's so much like they have to buy their own wands. They have to buy their own robes. They have to buy their own brooms. They have to buy, you know, other little things to help them with their classes, like the books. Maybe they have enough funding where they're okay. My hope is that the school gives them like a stipend because otherwise what? It's like this classist system where if you're not wealthy enough, you can't ever operate. Like that sucks. Yeah. That's such a massive advantage. That was the biggest thing is I was afraid that we were going to see this lesson and then Ron was going to be like, I can't pay for that. And see, but that would have been good. Not. Honestly, it would have been <laughs> just like true. And then Harry could go into his, you know, Scrooge McDuck vault <laughs> of money and then be like, here's 12 galleons. He's my mom's wedding ring. Yeah. <laughs> At this point, Harry has a giant vault and he also is a homeowner yes like he owns a home in london <laughs> he's yeah. oh he's made it. in the shade baby <laughs> he is fine so and he's fine <laughs> 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 we will get into later about how uh, all good wizards are hot when they keep talking about Voldemort being hot. Uh, they kill the hottest ones, though, for sure. Cedric, uh, too soon. And Sirius, who they call Ugh, hot a lot. So hot. <laughs> uh, the only hot one left is Voldemort. <laughs> Especially now that he's a snake. Mm, <laughs> that nose was, thank God he got rid of it. Uh, so much better. Uh, so Lavender creeps up behind Ron, puts her hands over his eyes, a cute thing, and goes, guess who, Juan Juan? And my thought, uh, maybe the only person that calls him Juan Juan. She gave herself away, Lavender. That's, that's just like the fucking... What's the word when you surprise someone? Hoodwink. That's hoodwink in 101. <laughs> so Ron is nervous about apparition. He wants to pass the test on his first time because Fred and George did. And Harry brings up, well, Charlie, the best person in your family, who uh, <laughs> <laughs> we never get to learn about in these damn books. Uh, he failed on the first time, right? That can't be a big deal. And then Ron says, oh, but Charlie's a lot bigger than me and then mimics a gorilla. So now we learn Charlie Weasley is awesome and he's also buff. Like Charlie Weasley's apparently like ripped <laughs> and would threaten to beat up the twins if they made fun of him. I'm also so curious what mimicking a gorilla looks like. <laughs> it said he stuck his arms out. So I'm guessing he did the thing where you kind of like put them like your fists over your knees kind of thing. Yeah, but that's not just a monkey. Uh, she didn't say a monkey. She specifically said gorilla. Yeah, I always get terrified because there is a difference between ape and gorilla and I don't know it and I'm going to get it wrong and then someone's going to be like, uh, actually... <laughs> I don't, I'm not a monkey doctor. Don't ask me questions. <laughs> I'm just saying that feels like a weird description. I can't visualize that immediately. Yeah, he also could have like beat on his chest or just like flexed his arm or something. I don't know. Um, <laughs> so Seamus Finnegan talks about how cool it would be to teleport just like that. And then the narrator says, and he clicked his fingers to signify disappearing, which British people call snapping your fingers, clicking your fingers. Fun fact. <laughs> I double checked this on Twitter with our now newly minted British consultant, Dottie James, who was on <laughs> the episode that just came out at the time of recording this. So I tweeted at her, I was like, do you call it clicking in all caps with a bunch of question marks? And she said, you call it snapping, which was the perfect interaction. <laughs> but yeah, apparently snapping your fingers in the UK is called clicking your fingers, which I thought was very fun. Glad to know that. And so I didn't think he was like speaking a language for a second. Yeah, I always thought clicking would be like clicking your tongue, but yeah, right. I don't He's know. Like, <laughs> He's <laughs> like, wouldn't operating be tight like this? <laughs> <laughs> what, Seamus, what? Are you okay? Uh, <laughs> so Harry then has his meeting with Dumbledore, and Dumbledore's hand is looking rough, really rough. And the narrator even notes, Harry wondered for perhaps the hundredth time what had caused such a distinctive injury, <laughs> which, yep, that is how many times this has They're come really up. really drawn it out. <laughs> they really point, are. Like, you have 
like the blue balls on this situation. This is not fair. It better be the best fucking story ever because they have hinted at it maybe eight times now, but uh, it better be incredible. <laughs> I hate knowing it when you don't. Uh, I will get into my theory a little bit later, but I do think that it is linked with Horcruxes and I think that the reveal will be together and I'm very excited. Uh, maybe, maybe not. <laughs> Ooh, good. Thank you for not saying anything. So Dumbledore says that he heard about the Scrimger situation. Harry tells Dumbledore that Scrimger wanted Harry to tell the wizarding community that the ministry is doing a wonderful job and the, the book just says, quote, Dumbledore smiled, which I, I think is just a great response of being like, huh, cute. I'd be interested how many times Dumbledore smiling is a mention in the books because I feel like it's not often. Yeah, and it's only for like sassy stuff. It's never yeah. like Dumbledore was happy. It's always Dumbledore was being cheeky. So he <laughs> smiled. <laughs> so apparently Fudge had the same idea and Scrimger wanted to implement it once he took over the office. And that is what the big write up about Dumbledore and Scrimger arguing that took place in the Daily Prophet it was about uh and to that Dumbledore says quote the prophet is bound to report the truth occasionally if only accidentally Ooh, little burn <laughs> little burn there Harry says it's Scrimger called Harry Dumbledore's man through and through and Dumbledore says oh that's preposterous that's very silly and Harry goes no I agreed with him and then Dumbledore tears up and says I am very touched Harry <laughs> which oh great now I'm crying <laughs> also can we talk about that it's so sad to me Dumbledore is what, like 115 at this point? Something How many like that. students has he had? Like, you can only imagine thousands, if not like tens of thousands. Yeah. And so it's like, if one student being like, you're the man, makes him cry. Like, what is missing in his life? Like, he well, needs more love. <laughs> I think it might just be more of the equivalent of the president tried to say something mean to you about liking a friend and you didn't back down. Yeah, maybe that's maybe that's more it. <laughs> it, did, it just made me so sad. I was like, somebody got to love this man. But Dumbledore is kind of easy to cry because he did tear up about how much Harry was going through when he was like, oh, that's why I didn't make you prefect but yo harry never should have been a prefect ever harry breaks oh, way no. too many rules to be a prefect so don't cry double he's like a bad boy yeah he's you know he's mischievous he does things he's not supposed to all the time he's probably leading the league in house points lost for gryffindor right and i will again <laughs> bring up that reframe this uh harry might not actually be a good dude like genuinely, what do we have to go off of other than him <sighs> fighting Voldemort? That yeah. he's a good guy. He hates yeah. people without real cause. Like that doesn't <laughs> sound like a good dude. He's not the nicest for sure. <laughs> I'm just trying to plant some conspiracy theories <laughs> in your brain. <laughs> I mean, it's good though. No, it's something to like consider. But I think it does make him more interesting is that he's not a perfect yes. hero to follow. Because it would be very boring if he was just nice all the time. Oh, can you imagine? <laughs> And Harry smiled, <laughs> and that's just every time he responds to something. <laughs> Malfoy was mean to Harry, and Harry walked away because he didn't want to give Malfoy the time of day. Malfoy only wanted to get a reaction out of Harry, and he wouldn't give it to him. <laughs> and Harry said, hey, Malfoy, how are things at home? <laughs> <laughs> Harry decided to bake a cake for Malfoy. Maybe that would cheer him up. <laughs> I will say also, it, it concerns me that Harry stares at his knees once he realizes Dumbledore is like, maybe crying. Because I'm just mm -hmm. like... He Give him a hug, man. What yeah, pat him on the shoulder or something. <laughs> like, console him. Don't just pretend you don't see him. That's <laughs> so weird. It's very weird. It's a strange reaction. Harry tells Dumbledore about the Snape Malfoy thing, and Dumbledore basically says, oh, that's not of great importance, and Harry gets very upset. Big surprise. <laughs> yeah. Harry's like, did you not hear what I said? Did you not understand what I said? And Dumbledore says, quote, yes, Harry, blessed as I am with extraordinary brain power, I understood everything you told me. <gasps> <laughs> Sass is real It is very Very real And I get that What Dumbledore Might be trying to say Here is I already know About all of this You're not giving me Any new information And I think he's got to Have a bit more Peace of mind To know that this is Going to make Harry Really mad Well and Harry's a child Yeah Like he's not a Patient person He's a child He's a teenage boy <laughs> He is uh, And he's not a Patient teenage boy He thinks he knows Everything He really Really does But I think Dumbledore Could have handled This a little bit better But so could have Harry and Harry never wants to drop this ever. So it's a little bit of like they're both to blame for this heated interaction. Right. Harry's full on running a smear campaign on Malfoy. <laughs> yeah, on Malfoy and Snape. Yeah, and Snape. I know. And clearly Dumbledore likes Snape for one reason or another. So mm -hmm. it's like, hey, don't talk trash about my friend to me. 
You know what I mean? Yeah. To talk to Ron about that. Like, save that for Ron. Ron hates him, too. I wish Dumbledore had said that. Save it for Ron. <laughs> he should have. He really should have. So they go back and forth a little bit. And finally, you know, they get to be a little more calm a little bit. I do note that uh, Phineas Nigelis butts in during their back and forth, which is great. I love Phineas Nigelis with all of my heart. <laughs> I'm very happy anytime he comes into the book at all. He was pretending to sleep. <laughs> yeah, he's classic Phineas. So Dumbledore reveals that the point of this meeting is to go over two memories. And he says that they are the two most important that he has stored up. In the same day, too. That's like right? a big day. Yeah, it is a big one. So Dumbledore gives a bit of a preface about Voldemort, kind of like Tom Riddle's beginning years at Hogwarts. Half for Harry and half for the reader, so we know what's going on. <laughs> he says that he was put into Slytherin almost immediately, like the sorting hat was put on and like just, it's like put on his head, it just goes, Slytherin! Like none <laughs> of the whole thing where it vamps for 12 minutes. Yeah. It's just, Slytherin, get out of here. <laughs> Apparently Tom Riddle was very happy about this. He parcel-tongued all over the place, looked into <laughs> Salazar Slytherin's history as much as he could, and the teachers loved him because he was talented and charming and good-looking, according to the book. Like, that was a justification for why teachers liked him. I mean, and but I think that's this true, is very though. weird. Is it? I don't... Do teachers like the hot kids? Well, no. I think there's a difference between, like, the kids that are known as hot and then the kids that are incidentally hot. Okay. Does that make sense? He's just, like, I guess, like, his face is pleasing to look at, so you don't mind talking yes. to him? And he's okay. a good student? Yes. Yeah. In my experience, teachers prefer those kids. Okay, <laughs> the good ones. <laughs> I find it strange that J.K. Rowling brings this up a lot with wizards. It's just, you know, the ones that are good at magic also happen to be very attractive. Uh, we get it a lot with Sirius. We get it a lot with Voldemort. And I'm just, I don't know. It seems like something that is kind of unnecessary. It is odd, for know. sure. I guess it's not that big of a deal. It just seems weird. Yeah. I mean, she definitely has some heroes that are, like, not great looking. Like, Mad-Eye Moody is not a good looking man. And he's a good yeah. guy, right? True. But other than Voldemort, it seems like all of the bad guys are ugly and described that way, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, all the mean people look gross. Yeah. Yep, it's people. a little bit of, like, a Disney situation. Yeah, exactly. Until Disney made Frozen because that dude, uh, he was good looking and then plot twist, he's mean. <laughs> <laughs> they were inspired by Voldemort. <laughs> yes. Dumbledore said that Voldemort was always very guarded around him at a fear for revealing his true identity to him. Dumbledore then goes on to talk about his crew, uh, most of whom basically come on to be the Death Eaters. He's kind of just got a, you know, he's got like an entourage around him. That... Which is so funny to recontextualize <laughs> the Death Eaters as just like a little high school gang. Yep, they're a high school clique that, you know, it's like that group of high school friends that still, like, hang out all the time together. Yeah, and, <laughs> and they were like, yeah, uh, we're going to pants Arthur Weasley today. Like, <laughs> and that escalated into murder and genocide. <laughs> oh. Cool. The way you're saying this makes me think that it's like, for a while, they were just the guys from Jackass <laughs> until they became evil. What's that? I'm I'm Antonin Dullahov, and this is Pantsing Arthur Weasley. Uh, let's see. My favorite things? Slim Jims. Uh, trapped. Monster energy drinks. I drink five a day. My heart is in bad condition. I would love to see, like, the early years here. Obviously, we know Voldemort was up to serious bad at this point, but yes. were all the other guys? I don't know. No. What's up with that Voldemort guy? I don't know. Let's make fun of these kids. Let's go pour Slurpees on the kids' homework. <laughs> He cites a few, quote, nasty incidents, uh, and he says one of which, as you know, is the Chamber of Secrets, which resulted in the death of a student. It's like, I don't think that qualifies as nasty incident anymore, Dumbledore. Somebody's dead. <laughs> that's I a think tragic that might be a, yeah, That's a bit more serious. Yeah. <laughs> So Dumbledore had to work very hard to get these memories about Voldemort. Basically learns that Voldemort is obsessed with his parentage. He searched the school far and wide to see if there's any mention of his father, who he believed was a powerful wizard, eventually realizes that he never went to Hogwarts at all. This caused him to abandon the name Tom Riddle because he was named after his dad and just go by Voldemort from then on out. And can you imagine a teenager in the class be like, uh, actually, I go by Voldemort now? Like when they're doing yeah, roll call? I can't imagine it because I saw a ladybird. <laughs> I the same thing. It's the same thing. <laughs> Shit. Oh, man. Yep. Right? He's like, um, excuse me, guys, a quick announcement today and every day forward. It's actually Voldemort, and please don't call me Voldy. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> it, it makes me think about that Soul Calibur character. I think his name is Voldo. They look very similar also. Okay, I've not played Soul Calibur, but I believe you. <laughs> <laughs> it's basically Bad Street Fighter. Listen, it was the 90s. Don't worry about yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> gonna get, oh, man. Uh, Soul Calibur Twitter is going to be really mad about this episode. <laughs> <laughs> it makes me wonder. Like, I wonder if Voldemort played it. Oh, that timeline doesn't make sense. <laughs> yeah. If anything, he was like, oh, yeah, we, I love Miss Pac-Man. <laughs> 
So after thorough research, Voldemort discovered the existence of the Slytherin surviving line and then went to find out about the Gaunt family. After giving this preface, Harry and Dumbledore go into the pensive. They are back at the Gaunt's house and it is rough. There's just mold and mildew everywhere. It's super gross. And there's a man inside with so much hair over his head and beard that you can't really see his face. So, mmm, yum. He needs a visit from the Queer Eye guys. <gasps> right? Oh my gosh. That'd be so good. Like, oh, you've got mold all over your house. Let's fix that. Also, Penny. haircut. <laughs> <laughs> the door opens and it's young Voldemort. And again, he's described as handsome. The person who we eventually learn to be Morphin just screams, you, and starts to charge at him. Voldemort says stop in parcel tongue, and Morphin is very surprised that he can speak parcel tongue. And also, there's a fun note where in the books, when they speak in parcel tongue, it's always in italics. So yep. I always mention them saying everything like kind of sassily when they say it. <laughs> stop! stop! <laughs> what? You can speak parcel tongue? Yes, I know how. <laughs> Who are you? You kind of look like that muggle. <laughs> <laughs> but then the outside perspective, they're just like sass, 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 back and forth to each other. I think I like your read better, and I think you should continue to mention to leave voice it that way as you go through. It's going to be very yeah. fun. <laughs> that it's the sassiest conversation. So they have a bit back and forth and we have this great moment where Morphin thinks that Voldemort is Tom Riddle, but something is wrong because, quote, you look like him, Riddle, but he's older now, isn't he? Older than you look. And he just like can't piece together that sometimes <laughs> people have kids and they look like them. Are there uh, no spells like, to make yourself look younger? Um. Oh, I actually don't like, there know. Must be like wizard plastic surgery that's just like a spell right or like a potion there are some wizards like tonks who are able to change their appearance but it's usually just like hair color and stuff like that yeah so maybe there is some sort of rule like some wizarding inherent rule where you can't anti-age because people would just do it if they could yeah they do it here with fillers like what a market they're missing out on just like make a <laughs> single potion that restores your like lack of wrinkles you're good to go billion dollar market <laughs> I'm just saying that doesn't seem that absurd to me he's like but wait you're too young like yeah. <laughs> it's, it's magic there's gotta be some magic there should be there should be but then it should be like plastic surgery where like it can look okay but then 10 years later it just like mm. looks really bad and it yeah. doesn't age well as and the potion ugh developed they got way better at it yeah mm -hmm. so morphin hates tom riddle senior for the whole merope 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 however you pronounce her name thing because apparently tom riddle senior robbed them of the locket before she ran off so this is when tom was still under the love potion and then the memory kind of fades to black and harry asks dumbledore what's up they leave the pensive and dumbledore says that is because that's all morphin remembers so what we basically learn is that morphin just woke up the next day with the ring gone and the riddles so tom riddle senior and his parents murdered across the street and here is my big question why the fuck did the riddles not move <laughs> what are you what are you doing what like tom riddle senior learns about all this oh yeah i was put against this like crazy spell and had a bunch of years of my life deleted by this witch and her entire wizard family they're very evil and they live across the street from us Wow, they, they just stay there? Are you <laughs> kidding me? Maybe it was like a turf war. They're like, this is my place, man. Uh, I'm not moving. I'm not moving either. I Move me mortal enemies across the street from each other. When they, when they described this, I could not believe it. <laughs> it's a little too convenient, for sure. Uh, but I mean, again, if you, if you do this to the books, like... It happens over and over and over again. Oh, <laughs> uh, I just, uh, uh, it just, uh, it's so stupid. Why did the riddles not move? Uh, the dumbest, 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 dumbest thing. Dumbledore then goes on to say that he describes the murder, says that the police are very confused, but the ministry knew what was up because, quote, Avada Kedavra does not usually leave any sign of damage. The exception sits before me. Yeah, and then he nods to Harry Scar, which I think is cute. It's cute. Yeah, it's a good little, like, oh, nice. But the ministry basically knew what you was up. You have to wonder also, like, when Tom Sr. came out of the potion spell, he was aware she was a witch, right? Yes, he realized this and that's why he ran away is because she kind of let him get off the Well, spell. no, he didn't run away. He ran across the street. <laughs> 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 but my question is, he probably told everyone he knew, right? Like, he, of course he did. Right, unless the ministry came in and did the thing where they didn't know and maybe right. that explains all of this. But did they, have they explicitly said that? I don't remember. That they erased that part of his memory that he didn't recall it? If they did, I am sorry and people will be mad at me and I might have just missed it. But that would make sense if the ministry came in and well, then so wiped his memory. Well, happens, but unless they explicitly yeah. said that, then I'm like, this scumbag dude told 
everyone that would listen to him, that he, that he was like, you know, corrupted by a witch, mm-hmm. then I think people would start to be like, yo, I think that witch probably, she was a witch just so you guys know. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, they would have had to have done it. That's the only reason that I can think of why they didn't move is okay, that the ministry that came did. in and did it. Yeah, they must for have. J.K. Rowling's behalf. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so the ministry knew it was up. They brought Morphin in for a trial and he admits to the crime with lots of pride about so. He is and he psyched. Just, he's very stoked about this. And he just keeps saying over and over again that he is very upset that he lost his father's ring. He says, my dad will kill me for losing this ring. He'll kill me for losing this ring over and over and over again, even when he gets put into Azkaban. And Dumbledore tells Harry that basically what happened was Voldemort did a stun spell on Morphin and then stole his wand, went across the street, murdered everybody, and then put a false memory into Morphin's brain, which I didn't know was a thing and is very devious, and then left the wand by him and then peaced out. And also, Tom Riddle is, or sorry, now Voldemort, the artist <laughs> formerly known as Tom Riddle, is still in <laughs> high school when he did that? Yeah, I think he was in like his sixth or seventh year. Dude, he he's got to be the best. I almost called him a magician. I'm going to call him a magician. He's got to <laughs> yeah. be the best magician in town, man. That's crazy. <laughs> yeah, he's very powerful to do all of this. I'm going to make so many people mad. I'm, so <laughs> I just, I'm going to only call him magicians from here on. Just, just always use the wrong words for everything. Hey, technically, <laughs> it's magic. They're magicians. It is magic. People that do magic are magicians. Thank you. <laughs> so the reason that the ministry did not know that... Tom slash Voldemort did all of this is because the whole detect magic thing that the ministry knows, like when Harry got caught with it before when he used it at his house, is because it's just location based. They know where magic happens, but they don't know who does it, which is very convenient, but is something that is backed up by J.K. Rowling because in the second book with the whole Dobby thing, when he raises up the pudding thing and then Harry gets in trouble for it, even though Harry didn't do it. So it does make sense and it's something she set up. So I'm not going to give her flack for like making this up on the spot. She planned this. (laughs) She did set it up, but it is confusing to me since they have such like oversight on like everyone gets their own wand. I just feel Mm -hmm. like it's got to be a little bit like each wand has a serial number and (laughs) yeah, like gun bullet stuff is supposed to be (laughs) a little bit. I guess. I mean, I guess it's just we learned that the ministry is very poorly run throughout the books, so we can just chalk it up to that. Basically, I mean, any federal bureaucracy like that checks out to me. (laughs) (laughs) So Dumbledore says that he got this memory out of Morphin with legitimacy. Uh, One thing that is very nice is that Harry is still mad about the Dobby thing because when he asked Dumbledore about it and Dumbledore explains it's like you know like with and Harry goes Dobby he grimaces and says oh, I love it it's so good that's so mean little Dobbs he's had such a hard life uh, yeah but Dobby was so annoying in the beginning but he gets so good I love Dobby now hated him before <laughs> so now it's the time for the second memory and they pour the liquid into the pensive and the liquid is kind of chunky Ew. and Harry thinks does memories go bad we learn why it's chunky later so basically it's a very short memory it is from Slughorn and they go into the memory and it's Slughorn in his office with Tom Dolohov and Lestrange. They're just kind of like chit chatting about stuff. Just very chummy like. I don't know if this is like a predecessor to the slug club type thing. No, it's the click, man. Yeah. So they're tight with Slughorn, but basically the clock strikes 11. So I guess they have to go to bed, but they all have to leave. But Tom Riddle does the classic like hang back to talk to someone about something. And then he asks Slughorn about Horcruxes (gasps) in a not very discreet way. And this finally, it's the first time that I have read the word Horcrux. I knew the word existed, but this is the first time that I read it. And I am so ready for shit to hit the fan. How does it feel? It feels good because it's something that has been, I feel, feel hinted at so long and like dangled in front of me and now I might finally get to learn what they are but not in this chapter or the next one we don't get to know what they are I'm so sorry it's all good but uh, it's it's a fun little thing here's basically what I'm thinking as far as it is so far Mm -hmm. I don't know exactly what they are yes I would love to hear this I do think that they are physical objects I think that they somehow either like make Voldemort stronger or something because obviously if he's interested in getting them he wants to become more powerful so I'm thinking it's like maybe like charms or something so, yeah, I think it's, like, maybe, like, you you have some sort of, like, item that, like, is magic or something, and you use it to do evil. Because, uh-huh. basically, I think that the, this ring and the the locket that they're so obsessed with, the, the ones that, like, go back to Salazar Slytherin, I think that these two things might be horcruxes, because they mentioned that Tom is wearing the ring in this 
seen. So maybe that is why like he's already wearing it. He might know that it's a Horcrux or think it's a Horcrux. So he wants to ask Slughorn about it. So I think that basically they are physical items. I think they're very evil. Um, and I think that they make Voldemort stronger. And I also think that that is why Dumbledore's hand is burnt because I think he's like doing something to destroy them because Dumbledore got the ring and the necklace. And then they're like not here anymore in the book. They were there and now they're not. So I think Dumbledore's doing something to destroy them. Okay, so so Dumbledore would be destroying them because he doesn't want them to fall into the wrong hands or something? Yeah, that, I guess that's what I'm at so far with what I know. Is like I think it's like if Voldemort has the Horcrux, so maybe it's like destroying the Infinity Stones uh, so, <laughs> <laughs> so that Thanos can't get them. Uh, so it's like, yeah, maybe it's like a thing like that where it's like if Voldemort has the Horcruxes, it'll be bad. Either that or just like if you destroy the Horcruxes from existing – it makes Voldemort weaker. I feel like if Voldemort needed them, he would be very persistent on trying to get them. Uh-huh. I, like, I feel like that would have been a bigger concern that would have come up is like, because they were so hellbent on getting the prophecy, I would imagine he would also be hellbent on like, I got to get that ring back. Uh, kind of okay, like so, Thanos so that, was. That's how you eliminate the idea that it's like a key to something. Yeah. Yeah. Because I think he would really, really want them or it would have come up earlier. Either that or they're doing a very good job of hiding that they have them. Okay, so you think there's multiple? Yes. Like, I think that the ring and the necklace are definitely multiple. I don't know if there's, like, a set number or if it's just, like, Horcruxes are a thing and these two happen to be them. How many do you think there are if you had to say a number? I'm just going to guess seven because that seems like a magic lucky number type thing. And they are magicians, as I said before. Right, they are. And there are seven <laughs> books and that would be very fun. So I'm just going to say seven because uh, okay. it you feels it right. First. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I'll be way wrong. And like, these aren't Horcruxes. There are 25 of them and they're <laughs> snacks. Like, <laughs> I mean, so. I can't confirm or deny that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for not. But yes, I can't wait to listen back on this episode when I learn what they are and either be very excited or very sad. It could be Ludo Bagman part two. So <laughs> he asks him not very discreetly about them. Uh, I, I want to make sure I read it from the book because it's just very funny the way that it's described. So he, he goes back and goes, sir, I wonder what you know about dot 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 about horcruxes and then this fog fills the room and the fog filled before when they were like chit-chatting and fog came in out of nowhere in the memory and then slughorn's voice rang out unnaturally loudly saying you'll go wrong boy mark my words which seems kind of sketchy and i didn't know what it was then this fog comes back again after he asks about the horcruxes and then again, they hear the voice, which is too loud and doesn't make sense. And it says, I don't know anything about Horcruxes and I wouldn't tell you if I did. Now get out of here at once and don't let me catch you mentioning them again, which makes me think, okay, this is, this is Slughorn messing with his memory to make himself look really good because this is clearly some bullshit. <laughs> or it's italicized. He randomly started speaking parcel to <laughs> There's a lot of fog in there. <laughs> yeah, so what Dumbledore does eventually reveal to Harry at the very end of this chapter is that's what the case is, is that it is Slughorn making this memory altered, altering this memory to make himself look better than he actually is. And he tells Harry that basically his plan, which I guess is the whole reason that he has Slughorn teaching this year, is so that Harry can try to talk to Slughorn about this and try to figure out what he actually said there. Dumbledore notes that because it's like a fog thing over the memory, that core memory is still there. So if Harry finds it out, he can figure out what is behind the fog, so to speak. And basically, Dumbledore is hiring Harry as a spy, and it is so good. It is but so, is so, it so though? good. But is it, though? Because at the same time, of all the choices of students he could turn into spies, Harry... I just don't really get it. I do. It's it's it, I, it's not because of Harry's ability. It's because Slughorn is obsessed with Harry. Yeah, that's, that's really true. what it boils that's, down that's to. That's true. But I'm kind of like, why? Hermione's the obvious choice in this situation for me. Like, yeah, I understand Harry's the chosen one when it comes. Oh, to Oh like, yeah, and Slughorn still kind of does like Hermione. But Hermione was so bad when she tried to sweet talk uh, at Borgen and Burks. She was so true. bad at that. She's bad at <laughs> lying, but she's yeah. great at spells and potions. Which Dumbledore suggests, right? Yeah. Basically, the problem, and we'll learn this in the next chapter, the main issue is that Harry doesn't consult Hermione thoroughly enough with a plan. He just goes in and is like, I'm just going to ask Slughorn the same question Voldemort did. It's like, you fucking idiot. Also, like, how much shorter would these books be if every time he had something to do, he consulted with Hermione first? It'd be two books. <laughs> yeah. Genuinely. It would be a lot, a lot shorter. So that is the end of chapter 17. And that's 
the end of this episode of Potterless. Mel, how are you feeling about secret agent Harry Potter? I'm feeling like maybe Dumbledore chose the wrong guy. <laughs> <laughs> he might have just gotten some things crossed and was like, oh, wait, shit. Did I say Harry Potter? I meant Hermione Granger. <laughs> <laughs> she uh, she wasn't the best. Harry's not your best choice either. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, honestly, is anyone would probably be a better choice than Harry. Probably. Like, yeah. you know, you want to probably be really good. Luna love good because she'd just be so weird. Luna is the top dog. She would have just said some weird shit, like so much stuff. And then he would have been like, uh, let me tell you about Horcruxes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just to get her to go away. Hey, you want to shut up? I'll tell you something cool. <laughs> like, I want to tell you about the ponies. And he's like, no, 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 yeah. anything. And please go. Anything. <laughs> oh, I was reading in my dad's Quibbler magazine. No, 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 no. I'll tell you about Horcruxes. <laughs> Harry, <laughs> yeah, but we'll see how it goes. I don't have high hopes. But Meow, thanks so much for joining this episode of Potterless. Uh, why don't you tell everyone about Punch Up the Jam, your lovely music podcast? Oh, hey, thanks. Okay, so you know when you hear a song and you're like, wait a sec, what did they just say? Or like, wait, what was that instrument? Um, I do, because I'm obsessed with them. And so mm-hmm. is my friend Demi, also from Vine. Yay, Vine Party. And so we have a podcast where every week we take a different song and we pick it apart. And then the most daunting part, we try to make it better by mm-hmm. debuting our own original version of the song. <laughs> <laughs> Some are really phenomenal. Your Shakira one of Whenever, <laughs> Wherever. <laughs> I, I had started listening to it at one point, um, and then I switched from like listening to it on my phone to listening to it at Spotify at work, and I was trying to like drag the playhead to figure out where like I left off, and I accidentally started like midway through your cover, and I was like, oh, whoa, they're, they're still doing more of the Shakira song? Your Shakira impression was so good. I legitimately thought it was still Shakira, but then you said the line like, lucky that my ass doesn't look like cream corn, and I was like, oh, okay, that must be the parody. Miel is very talented. <laughs> And also, I am lucky that my ass isn't like cream corn. Yeah, I don't think that'd be good for anyone. (laughs) But yes, Punch Up the Jam is amazing. It's either songs that are amazing and you love or songs that you love to make fun of. And then you just go through the lyrics and make fun of them. And it's super good. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you so much for having me. This is such a treat to get to talk about Harry Potter again. It's been uh, about 15 years. (laughs) Well, glad to have you back. And you're going to be on another episode. So it's going to be so good. But yes, thank you so much for joining. Listeners, thanks so much for listening and until next time as they say in the wizarding world of harry potter before they take a big old dive into the pensive wizard on (laughs) (laughs) if you need some potterless merch in your life we have an entire store if you go to bit.ly slash merch on you can get potterless shirts in every hogwarts house color you can get posters about ludo bagman you can get stickers you can get wizard on enamel pins there's all great stuff just head to bit.ly slash merch on potterless is created by mick schubert it is hosted by mick schubert it is edited by mick schubert it is produced by mick schubert as well as leon davis vicky garcia aaron johnson erica and calvin bauer sadie bear chessie horgan natalie klobuchar deborah wilkins klaus or loku alex stark rebecca adam frank chiodo marchismo tori Larzik, samantha rose juan sanfilio jenna dowsett kieran webb luis nisak akansha saxena rebecca vinsnes abid ahmed caitlin jordan pontalo benjamin bridges rosemary dodge jill boulay maria lisa c keen maria paulson ariel bird romina rivadanera camille doc anthony bonarigo diego matienzo russell dunk jenny nelson dustin Molin cooch katie rogers audra indiana mercer eleanor curlin sydney cawthorn billy hinton ross and batamana micah cole andrea franz nikita power colette smith chrissy blackburn trina unadcat jeremy bonnie stephen gagne lala palmer chelsea green taylor armstead sammy curti love cash longer Shervani Patel, Ali Madsen, Kalmich, Cassandra, Aponte, Roxy Sanchez, Melissa Traver, Amelia Kraus, Vince Clancy, Sean Montag, Jeremiah E. Hurd, Courtney Allingham, Sarah Nink, Jesus J. Morales, Ben Silver, Emily Bird, Francisco Bautista, Rachel Guthrie, Mary Bushland, Sharice Camontague, Zachary Polito, Gabriel Medcroft, Jessica Ann, Natalie Jung, Arna Goodna Brandy Baldonado, Melody McGinnis, Kristen Chavez, Jonathan Swinney, and Lexi Vergara. Web designed by Kelly Beckman, and the music is by Bettina Campamanes. For any and all information about the show, head to powderlesspodcast.com. You can find us on any of your preferred podcasting apps, including Spotify. Just search for Potterless. And you can find us on social media. Twitter is at PotterlessPod, Facebook.com slash Potterless, or Instagram.com slash Potterless Podcast. Again, thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much for sharing the show with your friends. It is honestly the best way that you can help us out. And until next time, as they say in the wizarding world of Harry Potter, wizard on!